comes to us by way of NASA Ames, correct? Sure, I got that right. And um, she's interviewing for the Tulsa Open Science Scientist position, and we'll be talking about her experience with wavefront sensing and infrared planets. Yes. So I think without any further ado, we'll just let Sabrina have the hour all that. So yes, so this is uh, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of completely the opposite of what LSST how we do. So instead of looking at the 3.5 degrees field of view, uh, I pretty much spent the last 10 years looking at a 10 arc second or even smaller with GBI 2.8 arc second uh, field of view. And uh, I picked up a subject that was, I think, relevant still for LSST even though the, uh, the field of view is very different, which is wavefront sensing and control. And I'm going to show two different uh, applications in GPI that we actually talked about quite a bit. I mean, uh, one of the cool um, studies that I'm doing right now for NASA Ames, so probably just for you know, people's interest in it because I, I think it's very interesting. So this is kind of what um, my outline looks like. So I'm first going to see you know, why do we uh, look at exoplanets uh, directly, so direct imaging of exoplanets, and how do we do that? And I'm going to go into the details of uh, so what I said, first the G5, the Gemini Planet Imager System, and show what I've done you know, during integration and test, and then what I'm doing right now at NASA. So why do we need to um, look at planets? So I, I guess this slide is pretty obvious, but we, we're interested in how they form, how they evolve. There's a lot of um, theory out there that other people write, and I'm just reading about them. Uh, you know, how do you create um, planets? Is it accretion? Is it migration? Distance stability? Um, how do they evolve? And then, you know, what we are really interested in when you actually do direct imaging, what's the physics of a planet? Um, what atmosphere do they have? So this is pretty much the only uh, science slide I'm having because I wanted to talk about the technical part better. But. And so to do direct, uh, to do direct imaging, what you need to do is to have a high contrast imaging system. Um, and look at a firefly um, that would be next to a lighthouse in San Francisco from Boston. So that gives you kind of the idea of how faint uh, and small in comparison a planet uh, would be. And there have been, before in you know, GPI and another system for uh, one that, you know, our group is very interested in is HI 8799, one of the first that has like the evolved, uh, four evolving planets. Uh, and then some embedded in disks. So there have been some um, planet detected. Were these planets that were known previously by spectroscopic means or by no. transits, or they were discovered in? They were discovered in, in direct imaging. It's kind of not quite the way the same uh, overlapping. So those are usually smaller. Um, separations. And this is uh, the instruments that are coming online right now. So two facility instruments, the Gemini Planet Major at Gemini, so just across the street from, uh, from LSST, and then Sphere in uh, at Paranal, still in Chile, but a little more north. Those are, as I said, facility instruments that are coming online this year. And then a couple of others, P6 is in uh, LA at Palo and those are also um, kind of so what do we need when you do high contrast imaging um, and that is to play with do is to the, the light coming from the parent star and when I say blocking you not only need to block the core, but you also need to block the diffractions. And you, to do that, you use a chronograph. Uh, and then in order to have really good um, extension ratio, so chronograph will, ex will block the light coming from the start, to actually make that happen really accurately, you need a very uh, And that means really good atmosphere control when you're working from the ground but also very good static aberration control. 
and that also works when you're in space. Um, and so right now also what we found out that in space you do also to control from temperature drifts uh, that are a little faster, but not on the order of the 125 kilohertz that you see in the atmosphere. And then uh, one thing we talked about a little bit this morning is the amplitude errors. So this is something that usually you don't care when you do seeing limited observations, but when you actually look at um, planets and you have such a different contrast, you have to uh, start taking care of the amplitude errors. And then step, um, stable platforms with differential imaging. So one way to increase the... So you're going to get an image with high contrast imaging that's called a low contrast. That contrast by either doing field rotation, so that the speckle that you create with aberration is going to uh, stay, but the planet will move or to do spectral differentiating, so looking at different bands, and then you just abstract them, and the speckles will actually scale with wavelength, but this, the planet will stay in one place, or polarimetry. And here I'm just look, showing how important it is to control the wavefront. This has only a one nanometer LMS non common path error, so you still see the planet, and when you go to five nanometer, it's pretty much swamped into you know, what I'm calling speckles or single dots. Uh, okay, I'm going to spend very briefly a few minutes on, because I don't know if you know the background on uh, the three techniques, so the chronograph and then uh, the AO and then image sharpening. Uh, the, the one, so this is the example of the GPI chronograph. Um, what I'm working on right now is also a Leo, a, an Apodice pupil, but it, it uses different technique. But the, the bottom line is that you need a, an apodization in your pu first pupil plane. So in chronograph, you talk a lot about pupil focal plane, pupil plane, focal plane. You know, something that is, it's very, very typical to chronography. So in the pupil plane, you put the apodization. That has the effect of reducing your airway rates, the uh, energy coming from your airway rates. And then you have your focal plane. That can be a hole or just a dot. And that's just going to block the light coming from the, the center. But if you do that, you still have a lot of diffractions coming out. So you're pretty much not blocking your diffraction rings, but your rings. So you need to have your Leo stuff to block that image, and then you get the, uh, the your image. I'm going to go back to that image later. Um, in parallel, you have to have a really good adaptive optic system, both from the ground and from space. So as I said, space is a little slower, but you still need one. And what does, that does very briefly, you have a deformable mirror, a reference sensor, and then the feedback. And so when um, you measure the wavefront error and then you send it back to the DM, and then you get a, a, good, a good image. So the difference when you do high contrast imaging is that you have to have an extreme adaptive optics, meaning that you have to have straight ratio of the order of 90% or more. Um, I showed you before, right? You had the, between the one nanometer RMS and the five nanometer RMS. So I know this is what's for active optics, but this is kind of the same deal. You need to get 10 to the minus 8 contrast. You really need to get a really clean um, image and remove most of the speckle coming from the atmosphere. And that means using a lot of actuators. Uh, this DM is a 64 by 64 uh, actuators. We're using a 48, in the, in the context of GPI, a 48 by 48 uh, region. And this is the wavefront sensor. It's the Shakama wavefront sensor. And it's using a quad set system. Um, and it's a high speed, it's 1.5 kilohertz, although we're using it at 1.2. Is there a simple way to understand why 10 to the minus 8 requires 1,000 degrees of freedom? Um, so the, the, this is also linked to the size. Like the, the number of actuators is also going to give you how big a field of view you're going to have. And so... Is there a scaling of, you know, how much actuation you need to get to the scale ratio? Yes. Um, I don't have a graph, but... Um, it, it's actually a, a mix also. So the number of actuators will tell you how many uh, sub-aperture you need in your reference sensing. And that also will tell you how bright of a star you can look at. So there's a trade-off, a little bit more complicated trade-off between what star you want to observe 
uh, what brightness do you want to observe? So right now for GPI it's between two and nine. Uh, and that would tell you how precise you want, you want to cut that brightness into. And so there's like a, a, a maybe a little bit more complicated one. So what wavelengths are, are you using? Are these systems running? Wavelength? It's mostly infrared, meaning like infrared. It's from one to 2.2 2 okay. microns. But the Shackerman uses the visible. Yes, right? and the Shackerman uses the visible from point seven to point, no, point six seven to point nine. Uh, in and space, the though. The formable mirror isn't cool, is it? Is it room temperature? It's room temperature. Yeah. It is um, uh, air circulated though because it's very sensitive to humidity, so it's actually sealed. Mm -hmm. But that's otherwise it's good. What kind of uh, what kind of what? Sorry. Detector. Uh, it's a CCID 66. It's a um, Lincoln lab. Lincoln lab. And this is read out at what rate? Continuously read out? Yes, so it's right now it's at 1.2 kilohertz. Um, so it, it has a few electrons of email noise, so that's, that was one of the. the the requirement. Now there's a E2 CCD that E2 V CCD. So um, and those are, I think, if GPI had been designed later, you know, that would have been something we could have done because it has zero electron shoot out noise. Um, so this is just lab performance, but I, I wanted to show you. So this is the, the star that's blocked, and then we were getting. Uh, like a few 10 to the minus 7. I'm going to go back to those dots. This is uh, due to the actual DM. The DM has a print through, and that diffracts light. So this is kind of a, a, an inconvenience in most cases, but I'm going to show you if I have time. I'm going to show you later that I'm actually using those to, uh, for my research. So. OK, and then the last part that I'm using, that we use a lot in uh, in high contrast imaging, especially from space, is to do image sharpening. So instead of using a wavefront sensor to measure your uh, your wavefront, you're actually looking at your focal your actual your actual image, just like you just as you go in and out of focus or phase diversity. So we have a couple of techniques to do that. So you're measuring a wavefront and assigning it to the DM. Um, the first one we called electric field conjugation. So you're pretty much putting probes phase diversity on your DM. Uh, and then you you have a model um, that you created of your optics and then your aberration. And with that model, you create this reconstruction matrix. Um, and you you have your electric field in the, in the focal plane, and that's what you're, and, and you actuate a comment. And you're actually looking at what to put on your DM to, to create pretty much zero in your, uh, in your image. So the, this is a three steps um, iteration at the beginning, and then a, a couple of iteration, and then at the end. And we have an improvement of about three in the contrast that we achieve. And that actually works because sometimes you have reference errors that come after the chronograph that would actually throw the light um, in the region of interest. And so the, the best shape on your mirror is not necessarily the one that you measure at your waypoint. And the other technique that we're using is speckle modeling, maybe more broadly known. Uh, so you're pretty much putting a sine wave on your DM, you're creating speckles, and then you measure the intensity and then the position, and then you can create a, a control matrix. So this so, is. Can I just a question on the last slide? Can you just you understand what is the electric field? Which electric field? You so you're pretty much measuring the wavefront in phase, uh, in, you're measuring the electric field. In where? In the, in the focal plane. Detector? In a detector, but that's kind of the same. In uh, so, if you're measuring a phase error in your detector, you're still going to send it to your DM, right? It's, it's your, your phase error. How is, I mean, how, how, is that, how is that phase error? I mean, the detector so you, just where it measures intensity. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I'm saying there's techniques called phase diversity. So pretty much what we are doing is uh, we're putting a sync function on the DM with different uh, phases. And you have four, we call them probes, and you have four different probes that you put on your, uh, on your DM, the mirror. And you're measuring the intensity, and then you're subtracting them 
and then you write equations that I can, I can go later. And from that, you can actually measure your phase and amplitude, and then really measure your, your, uh, your electric field. And so that's important for us because, as I said before, not only you have to take care of the phase, but you also have to measure the amplitude to get to better contrast. So I'm actually using that a lot, especially in my second time of the second part of the talk. So again, I, I hope you're not too hungry. So I, I'll go a little bit now that I have you know the basics: so chronograph, uh, adaptive optics, and then uh, image sharpening. I'm gonna talk about the Gemini plant image, and I'm just going to focus on, you know, relevant stuff. For those who don't know, this is uh, what it looks like. You have the light comes from the telescope from here. The bottom part is uh, the adaptive optics bench. Then it goes into a calibration system. The calibration system measures the low-order uh, reference aberrations, and then the low temporal aberrations. Uh, this was done by JPL. Sorry, the AU was actually a mix, the actu actual code was done by Lawrence Livermore and the uh, mechanical structure by uh, the NRC Canada. And then the, the top one in red is the uh, integral field spectrograph. And that was done by UCLA and in um, Montreal. And then in the three system, you have the chronograph. So that was one of the challenging parts that you had to integrate the upwardization in the AO the uh, focal frame mask in the calibration system, and then the uh, Leo in the, in the IFS. So you had to be very well aligned. That's what I was talking a little bit before. Um, this is how what it looks like. I just like this picture because that shows how crowded it is. We had uh, weight and space constraints on the design. Again, I'm not. I didn't really work on that, but you know, it's something that I had to deal with as a consequence, because aligning all that in this very cramped environment so was... Just, just one point of clarification. So the imager that's actually detecting the planets, that's this integral field spectrum. Yes. There's no separate imager. That's no. Right. And that's another thing that I, if I had done the design, I would have actually asked for, having just a camera to see what it looks like without having to integrate in the integration yeah. with that. Oh. So as I said before, you need a very high order, high speed uh, adaptive optics, and then also very high quality. So all the OAPs that were um, purchased are uh, uh, custom made, and they're super polished to two nanometer LMS. The, it, the light comes from up there here, bounce all the on all the mirrors, and then the, the calibration system that I talked about is on the bottom. Um, Yes, that's, that's what you were asking. So this is from 700 to 900 watts. And then uh, by design, we want a trail better than 90%, which we actually got. So the calibration system is a 7 by 7. It actually has two components. It's a low-order weapon sensor, a shakaman with a 7 by 7 um, sub-aperture, and also an interferometer to measure the high-order aberrations. The issue with that is uh, that we, because of the IFS, we have a lot of vibration due to the, the cooling system. And the vibration and interferometry doesn't really go together. So we, are having, we haven't really commissioned that part yet. So that was one of the heartbreaking for the first commission runs that we actually left that, that out. But there is plan to actually uh, make it work. And then we have a lot of... You're solving that by isolate, vibrate, vibrate, originally isolating the interferometer, or how are you solving uh, Well, that's something that we're still... So right now, they just changed the, the padding on the... It's actually uh, on, the, on the actual IFS, so they, they, actually, they put more padding. But this is something they're working on right now. I've been a little more detached uh, since then. Um, then you have a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, cleaning and centering mirrors. And then you also use the, you're interacting with the M2 on Gemini to do some offloads of those areas. Uh, so I think I mentioned that, that the integration test was done in Santa Cruz up to 2013. Um, the one challenging part was that it was a multi-team effort with, di with different locations. 
in order, my, one of my contributions to uh, the integration and test was that I developed a telescope simulator with Brian Gorman with actual face plates to simulate the, the atmosphere. Uh, and then I worked a lot on measuring the performance and incorporating the requirements. And as I said a little bit earlier too, it's very, very important to have a precise alignment of, of the system, especially with all these components being in like three different um, places. This is what the telescope simulator looks like. So what I mean by telescope simulator is that you're simulating the beam coming in the, your instruments. So you don't have to have an eight meter telescope to do the test. And uh, we did that with OAPs, um, with face plates. This is a face plate that actually simulates the atmosphere. It's, it's made of uh, acrylic. And then an, a lens that we custom made to actually make sure that we didn't have any defocus between the uh, instrument and the reference center. Because lens, if you have a refractive optics between 0.7 and 2 microns, you can have big chromatic defocus. So that was uh, done also with Brian. Uh, and then that's the entrance of GBI. So the phase screen is static? It's, it's static. moving, so you have a little motor here, oh, it and it's rotating. Yeah. So you have to have it big enough so then it actually yeah. not repeat itself. And that's kind of what it looks like. This is something I studied with Andre Tokovinin when I was doing my PhD. Uh, I was starting with hairspray, but then we went into to, uh, acrylic on glass, and it was, it was really well for what we wanted to do. I mean, it gives you a pretty good chromogram of power spectrum, um, and it gives us enough rotation that we could actually simulate. You can still see like the direction of the wind, but it was well done. Uh, hopefully, I'm not going to lose you, but I, I just wanted to show you a little bit how complicated the alignment was and then um, why we spent a little bit of time on it. This is a flat view of what I showed you before with the adaptive optics table, the wavefront sensing, the interferometer, what I call the calibration system, and the spectrograph. And then if you look, the chronograph uh, is in like the three different stages. So the, the aquatization, the focal plane mask, and the uh, LEO. So you have to make sure that the light coming into the focal plane mask is always on the, on the focal plane mask within five million seconds. Uh, and then the LEOs are uh, aligned. So you have to align the LEO, the equalizer, all the maps, and the pupil to within 0.1% uh, of the aperture. And to do that, uh, you have pointing and centering mirrors that are not in a focus, in a focus or pupil plane, right here and right here. You have the MEMS, you have the woofer, you have the input fold, um, and that's pretty much what's moving, which is quite a bit. So we spend a lot of time to show you even more the complexity this is what it looks like. So you have the telescope pupil, the MEMS DM, the woofer that are moving, and that have to be, um, and the diapodizer, the VO, all that have to be conjugated to, to each other. Uh, we, for that, we used a knife test and parallax test to make sure they were aligned. To measure them, you have the AO wavefront sensor, the order wavefront sensor, and then another, uh, in places that you're not in pupil plane or focal plane, you have the input fold and then two PNC mirrors. You don't have to retain that. What I wanted to show is that you have a lot of arrows going to, you know, does everywhere. The do, does, does the woofer, is that, is that piston? No, it's actually um, a It's tip tilt, I get that. It's tip tilt, but it's also low order wavefront sensor. Ah. Uh, low order correction, sorry. Uh, and it has, Nine by nine, actually. Sorry, I'm blanking out. Okay. Uh, and so the, the woofer is important because the MAMS doesn't have enough stroke to right. correct for its own aberration and the atmosphere. So we had to have this um, this woofer. Yeah. Anyway, so there's a lot of things. Um, we finally figure out after a while which arrows had to be first and then. Uh, so um, I'm curious, your procedure that you use to do all this alignment, um, I mean, how, how did you come up with the, the right steps and the right ordering? I mean, was that, was the, did you do some sort of, you know, systematic 
analysis on the degrees of freedom to come up with um, we did also some failures, but yes, we did, we also did that. So what's very important is uh, the one thing you need to start with is being on a wavefront sensor and being on a focal plate mask at the same time. So being aligned to both of them, because if you have, um, I'm not sure how many of you are very familiar with Shakama, but with Shakama you actually measure the motion of the centroid related to the central position. But you can choose where you put that central position for reference. Right. So you can put that as your, if you have aberration in your system, not on the path, you actually introduce that not common path into your reference, right? So if your reference is wrong, then you're actually driving your MEMS to send the, to send the, um, the beam somewhere else. So for example, if you have the PNC mirrors were very sensitive to temperature, so we had to build that model very accurately in order to not introduce tilt that would then be brought up into the woofer. So it was mostly that, like trying to find, figure out which element would actually introduce errors uh, and then make sure that you take a good care of them in your model so that you don't have this frequency with two. So that was the first step. Uh, and that's how we got the alignment for that part. And then the alignment for the IFS is a little bit easier. And also, so that, that was one, so that's for the beam. And then for the for the pupil, well, we just have to have all the pupil aligned. That's easy, you know. How, 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 how crisply focused do the pupils have to be? I mean, right, they're, they're you have to position in the in the z direction or yes. along the optical axis. Yes, where and then, so that's where the interaction between different components are very critical. Oh. Um, I don't have the number on top okay. of my head, but there is a number. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the the focus on the PNC. So here we have about a millimeter, and we did actually it didn't really matter that much because we were slow beam. Oh. Here it was a little bit more. What's the F number? Uh, right here it's 65. And this is F16. You're all mechanized pumps, or how, what's, what's, the, what's the alignment feature? I mean, is it the quarter 20 screws with a, or is it? No, it's, it's modernized. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and that's another thing we had to deal with. So. It's a little bit technical, but the Shakaman is a special filter Shakaman, which means that there's a mask in the focal plane before the Shakaman that you can close to reduce aliasing. Aliasing is a, a bug in the Shakaman away from the constructor that can actually get back into your system and create aberrations. And that special filter was fixed. But because of the PNCs moving with temperature, then the beam was actually going off the special filter, so we had a lot of issues. So we had to do a remi protocol remediation, but we actually had to put the special filter on XYZ, uh, XYZ page, not Z. So how much of this alignment process was um, automated in a control system, and how much was just humans moving? Forward? At the beginning, it was just humans, and then that's where we had that plan, that, that diagram and then now it's all automated. You just press a button and it just aligns it. And then takes into account models and then and it's it's very uh, so we stay in between I have the number after that but we stay on, on target in within a couple of milliamp seconds and, and the pupils don't even from one night to the other they're pretty constant. I mean the temperature doesn't really change that much between one night to the other. It's really from one season to the other. So and that's, that's, that was one of the really good thing about Santa Cruz. We were not happy about it, but we had so much variation swing in temperature. So in the morning, you could get up and we had 60, and in the afternoon, it was going up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So we had such a big uh, temperature difference. But it was actually uh, good for us because we found a lot of bugs that we probably would not have found. Uh, I would go really fast here. Was this but done in a high band sense? Yes. Yeah, there were a big um, clean room, plus 1,000. And then uh, after that, after I left, they actually had a, a portable cold room there for testing temperature. Uh, so 
the next two slides, I'm just going to show like an example of pupil and then uh, being alignment, and then I'm going to move on. This image is uh, a stack between of, of all the pupils, so you can see an, a little grid. That's the appetizer. You can see the poke on the mems. Uh, the woofer and the mems were aligned by hand before beforehand, and then uh, so, and that's in the Leo plane. And to do the alignment, what we did is we poked actuators to create a cross. So that's the intersection, and then fits uh, a circle with the old transformation and then kind of make sure that both of them were uh, aligned. So this is a paper that Dimitri Shamansky wrote. And then for beam alignments, I don't know if you remember, but our focal plane mask is actually a hole, a mirror in a hole. So what we, we do is uh, we move the, the beam on that focal plane mask and then measure the intensity with, let me show you because there's a low order reference sensor here, so we measure the intensity on that low order reference sensor, and then we just fit that back to the input fold uh, and the references. Sorry, any, any references, and then we get um, the beam onto the focal plane mask very accurately. This is tip and tilt in uh, mini arc seconds, so we can get it within the five mini arc second requirement. And that's just to compare the tolerances and the, the achieve. So telescope pupil to lens, uh, we get really overachieved, and for the AO weapons as well. For the appetizer, the uh, measurement is a little bit more coarse, so we actually just meeting the requirement. And then for the EO stuff, kind of the same thing. Um, the lab, I'm going to show lab performance. This is using spec modeling, the technique I talked to you a little bit before. And then we reached up to 10 to the minus 6. Uh, this is raw contrast again, so just like one exposure, one image, just no post-processing uh, after that. And then finally, we went on the telescope in November 2013. This is Bruce McIntosh in front of his baby. My baby is right here. <laughs> and uh, this is the first slide. So the first slide was spent a lot on the alignment, which is why I actually went. This is the pupil alignment. Don't be afraid about the beginning. Uh, if you, there is a camera viewer, a, view, a pupil viewer that is not in the, in the path, and that's what was beginning uh, due to over just two small optics and apertures. But this is not impacting the performance at all. You have the spiders. And this is what the result of the stacked image from the IFS. So that's what I was talking about. You have speckles that move with the wavelength, so you're stepping through the wavelengths right now. And then the planet here doesn't move. So this is a technique you use rather than seeing the field rotation of the planet. Yeah. You're doing the wavelength. So you can do both. Uh, so this what was is, the contract ratio on that one? I'm sorry. Uh, that was 10 to, it, about 10 to minus 6 along here. Wow. It wasn't the first, the first try. It was not. Um, this is just a comparison between Nikki at Gemini, which was a high contrast imaging before the, the G5. Uh, this is about half of the time, and you see like the difference. This is a much cleaner, and you reduce the, the pickle a lot more. It was very impressive. But that's what I'm talking about. See how the field of the field of view is about 28 arc seconds total, and the controllable region is one arc second. Um, I just wanted to show quickly because that's one thing I've done, but. Um, I guess for SSC, it's not really, you're not going to have an ADC. So this is uh, the, if you are using an ADC, so as the IFS is about a 10% band. So between when you look at really, really low zenith angle, then you have a dispersion. And this is important for two reasons. One is you have to be within, uh, you have to be behind a chronograph within five mini arc seconds. So if you have too much dispersion, then you're not blocking the light. And then also for uh, astrometry, so the, in planet detection, you want to detect the planet, but you also want to measure the orbit. So if you're not precise, then. Uh, so we spend a, quite a bit of time. Uh, this is something you could not do in a lab, so you had to do it on the sky, because it's hard to yeah, simulate the dispersion. But we got it in spec for the, uh, for the coronagraph positioning. So we got it better than five in the half second. And this ADC was a rotating prism? It was two. Uh, 
two rotating prisms, yes, made of two prisms each. So that's, that's why the challenge was you had to really make sure you had the right relative uh, positioning and then the whole assembly was moving depending on the um, safety tackles. And that's the end of my uh, talk on GPI. Uh, now GPI is, as I mentioned to a few of you, the fourth commissioning run is uh, happening next week, so the week after, the week after. And then after that, it's going to go into um, um, the survey. So it, they got um, time to, to look at planets. And I'm blanking out a number of hours, but it's a lot of hours. 890 hours. So this is GPI. Um, it was very interesting for me because it has a lot of layers of weapon control and sensing. It requires really, really precise alignment. And um, and I just said that. So, do I move on or do you have other questions on GPI? How far in the survey are you so far? Uh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> so the the survey they've been observing stars with uh, um, Gemini and uh, Keck to do like a pre uh, survey, but the, sur the the instrument is not finished finished commission yet, so it's going to start this fall. So yeah, it's really zero. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to switch to what I'm doing at NASA, so it's less technical. Uh, I pretty much went in from integrating this uh, instrument on the telescope to going back to the lab, which was, but going back in the context of space, which was very interesting and different. In some ways, very similar. Uh, this is the, the layout that we had in our lab. So. It's very similar to the concept of the, the Leo chronograph, where you have those two mirrors here that creates an acquisition. So that would be your apodized uh, mask. The, the good thing about those is that it's a PIA system, and I'm sure you know about that because Olivier Grillon actually works downstairs. Uh, and he's the one who uh, designed those. The advantage is that you're not losing any light. So when you go, you put a an apodized uh, mask, you decrease the, the amount of light, right? You, it's a mask, so you're blocking the light. This is reshaping the light such that it actually creates an apodization, so you're not losing the light. And they look like that, so you see they're kind of distorted. Um, this is just the NASA, so you see how distorted the NASA logo is. What's the diameter of those? Uh, this was 90 millimeter, oh, but you can find them really small, or you can also find lenses. Uh, we, we have a couple of lenses that are smaller. Um, then you go to, uh, the, in, that, in that particular graph, we had the MAMS right here, and then we had the focal pair mask. And the focal pair mask had a reflective part to go to the lower the wavefront sensor, kind of with the same idea as GPI. And then the Leo stop, so that's the focal pair mask, the Leo stop, and then C. And we had a really, really um, precise cooling system. And then uh, waveform control, speckle modeling, electric field conjugation. And as I said, you know, we're back in the lab, so there's like kind of experiments. And that's kind of the last year uh, achievement that we got in air. Um, this is a C mask. So the difference with GPI is that if you look, you have no waveform sensor, really. I mean, you have the lower the waveform sensor, but you don't have the shack outline waveform sensor. So all the sensing you're doing is with a CCD. Uh, and you're creating a dark hole uh, using electric field conjugation because you don't need to be fast, so you can actually take your time to measure and then go deeper and deeper and deeper. And the the cool results about that, and I don't know if it's going to be relevant to you, but we got 10 to the minus um, seven at 1.2 lambda over d. So you have your PSF. And you're at one lambda over d, and then you're, you're pretty much decreasing from 10 to minus 3 um, to 10 to minus 7, the amount of light that you have in that region. And then from 2 to 4, you go down to 8, 10 to minus 8. And also, a very good uh, result from that lab is that you're very constant. Uh, this shows the outer region, so this is a contrast achieved as a function of time in the outer region, and then this is the inner region. So in the inner region, you go up and down a little bit more because you're more sensitive to vibration, temperature, 
uh, even though we're controlling it. And then also we figured out at some point we had a fan for the camera that was creating a lot of turbulence. So that was really good experience for me to go and then, you know, chase what. So in your previous chart, how long does it take from the time you turn the system on to the time you converge to that state? You talk um, days. Okay. One day. Uh, EFC is a little bit more uh, faster than uh, the spec online. Spec online literally takes a day or two. Uh, that can take a night. But yes, it's, that, it's really slow. Yeah, is that then is it the computation that is needed or is it just the number of iterations that it takes to Both. get there? Yeah, so the computation, one iteration takes about a minute. So yeah, not doable with atmosphere. But I mean, we've been talking, and there have been labs where they actually we are thinking about trying to go faster. But um, but the, the good thing is that so I you find a shape for your mirror that you need to apply. You go back the following day. If you haven't really touched anything, you can actually reapply the shape. So. It's a different mentality. You're not chasing the atmosphere. You're right. chasing. You're in. You're in space. So you're not chasing drifts that are that fast. So you only use the map, or you? Change yeah, we the use the maps. But you don't change the coronagraphic mirror. No. 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 The coronagraphic mirrors are fixed. They're actually designed to create a certain aberration, a certain aberration. Sorry. But you don't need to adjust <coughs> that. OK, so I used in the last year, I used, uh, well, I haven't used it yet, but I'm going to use it soon. Electrific conjugation of speculonic, you can use it to actually now look at multiple stars. So one issue when you have uh, chronography, you're blocking the light coming from one star, right? But it's only limited to a one star system. So, so far, nobody really looked at you know, what if you have a double star and then look at the region around that double star. Uh, so this project that I'm going to finish the, the presentation with, I have about three minutes left, is, uh, is pretty much dealing, again, shaping your wavefront, measuring and shaping your wavefront to be to pretty much look at your image and discover whatever you want. But, but before you go on, this space experiment you were talking about before, what, when is that going? Well, I'm going to. Oh, you're going to come back. Yes, yeah, so th those were lab results. Right. Um, so this is kind of, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm back to doing a little bit of research. I see. And there's a few applications, but they are not financed so, yet. So these, not. this is research of a possible space Exactly. Okay, yeah. And one of them I'm working with, uh, Glenn Schneider, who's also downstairs. Uh, yes, so. My goal right now is to look at planets around multiple stars. So why is that complicated? But even if you suppress the, the, the star you want to look at, this is the region that you want to create your dark zone to look at planets. So you suppress that light. You have the companion, and then the light coming from that companion, let's say you don't have any aberration, is still 3 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 8. In space, to the aim is to look at Earth-like planets, and then you look at contrasts of 10 to the minus 10. So this is already, you know, a reason for looking at um, Earth-like planets. And when you have aberration, that goes up to 10 to the minus 7. So those are simulations that I've done in that lab. And then the other issue is that, I don't know if you remember, but if you have a deformable mirror, you have a certain number of actuators, and so that means you can only correct over a very small field of view. So with my DM, I can only remove the speckles inside that region, but there are still leftovers uh, in the other outside that region. So what we're trying to figure out with all the solutions, we called we have the multi-star wavefront control and the supernaqueous wavefront control, or a mix of both. And I'm just going to take a few minutes and then show results because I think it's really interesting. I know it's not technical, but it's uh, complete. I'm simulating a system and then trying to play with uh, the wavefront. So the super and high wavefront control, that's the solution to make sure we can correct out past the Nyquist frequency of the DM, which a lot of people thought it was not possible yet. So in that 
graph, I show that I'm actually suppressing the light coming from the star. So if you use um, a star shade, for example, you've heard about star shades. So you put your chronograph outside your uh, satellite, and that pretty much removes the whole light. And you don't have diffraction rings that I showed before in the introduction. You, when you use the chronograph in the system, then you still have your diffraction rings from your telescope. But if you use the chronograph before the telescope, then you don't have your diffraction rings. So let's, let's say we're in that, um, in that scenario, but you still have the light coming from the second star. Um, and the, the way we actually me um, measured and controlled that dark region here, even though the star companion is right there, is by putting a grid and creating diffraction spikes, I mean diffractions and replicas of the, the companion star. And that allowed us, oh sorry, and the way we did that was either to use a DM, so if you look at the maps with the VCO, you see its structure, print through, that actually diffracts light. And I talked a little bit about it earlier, where I was saying that you can create amplitude aberrations. And then we, that's a, a Zygo image. And then you see those dots. Those are due to that print through. Or you can just use a diffractive pupil. And this is something also that Eduardo Van Dyck was using here downstairs uh, to do astrometry. But the difference is that here we can put the grid anywhere. We don't have to print it on the primary mirror, which is a little cleaner. And that creates those dots. And this is the result I got. So the, this region is at 100 lambda over D. So again, a MEMS, if it has 32 actuators, can only correct up to 16 lambda over D over a very small region. So I'm going way past that region. Um, this is pretty much the, uh, the zero to 100 lambda over D. The correction of the DM is right here, and I'm actually going all the way over there. And the, from the 10 to the minus 8 that I got at the beginning, um, this is without aberrations. I went down to 2 10 to minus 10, and then with aberration, I get from 4 10 to minus 7 to 1 10 to minus 10. So this is actually pretty cool. Okay. So how, how so this is monochromatic, right? This is monochromatic. Right. So how sensitive are you to with the the So the I light? got the same I don't have a graph because I you know uh, I have the same results with a three percent band. I'm running into computation trouble with ten percent. So I need a better computer. <laughs> uh, but for that and so it's gonna also depend on how far you are, of course. Of the spread of the, the bandwidth is going to be dependent. But yes, it's something that I, I know because monochromatic doesn't really do it anyway. You need at least a 10% band. Yeah. Um, and then try not to lose you. This is a multi star wavefront control. Uh, so that's when you have a two star. And then for now, I'm actually pretending they're inside the DM control boson to not. And here's the, the example of a, the B star and the A star separated by just the 30, the 16 lambda over D field of view of the controllable region that you can achieve with the MAMS. This is 16 lambda over D. And I'm cutting it into zones from 0 to 8 and then from 8 to 16. This is for A, this is for B, and this is the overlap. So the way we deal with a multi uh, star with control is. If you have the two stars, they are not coherent. So you have to be careful to, if you use one part of the DM, one set of modes, you're going to also impact the other one, the other star. Uh, so you use the two different sets of DM to correct independently for each star. I'm pretty sure I lose a lot of, lost a lot of you, but <laughs> if you have questions, just ask me. Um, and this is the result, and that's more important. This is before correction, that's after correction. This is the actual image that I care about, where you have the two star A and B. Uh, and I'm placing myself in the case of Alpha Centauri, which is the closest uh, star we have right now, which is interesting because it actually has a planet, and it eventually has a planet. Um, this is after correction with the same thing, B, B and A. Uh, and I'm getting. 10 to the minus 8, um, and I have the numbers later, but 1 10 to the minus 8. The, um, the next two graphs are only if I have the, the shape of the mirror, 
remember, I'm always trying to find the shape of the mirror that actually created that hole. So this is the shape of the mirror. And to see that I was doing the right thing, I actually send that to only the star A and then the star B and make sure that I actually was getting dark zone instead of getting light that would actually kind of somehow cancel each other. Uh, so this is actually really wor working really well. And the numbers I get, uh, I'm going from 1 to the minus 4 in that region to 5 times the minus 8 with two stars. Um, so the, to move that dark hole around in the system, is that just a software thing? On how it's a software it? thing. So you can reposition that anywhere around? Yes. The so the, the thing you have to keep in mind, though, is if you do, you're, you're measuring an electric field. And uh, to send a correction, if you correct only the phase, you can correct for a 360 degree field of view. If you're correcting for the amplitude as well, then you have to only correct for one side because you don't have enough. Or you can use two deformable mirrors, one out of pupil, and use a type of effect to correct the balls. And those are the applications. As I said, they are not missions that are funded yet. Uh, the one that we're working really Focusing really right now is the ASAN imager. So it's to look at, it's a 25, let's say, centimeter telescope to look at uh, Alpha Centauri and look at the planets along the A and B stars. The one that. Uh, so that's a, a whole satellite that only looks at one star? Yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> called a. <laughs> yes. So you have a concept that I, I was also, I was not aware of that, but you have those CubeSats. Uh, yeah, so nice. those are little, you know, little yeah, yeah. satellites that you put into a bigger mission to. Away, so. But yeah, so this is, you know, <laughs> so is, is that a cube? It's, not, it's a little bigger than bigger cube. Than it started right? with a cube size, and now it's not a cube. It's kind of in a big. The cube size are 10 centimeters. Yeah, it's cube size. But you have a cube size of cube size that you can. Yeah, there's, a, there's like a, a one unit, two exactly, units, three exactly. units type of thing. One unit, two units. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think Jared Mattis, I don't know if you know him, he works here too, and he's interested in that as well. The uh, other, the one that I got hired for was called Exceed, and it was to look at discs. Uh, and the, the PI is Ben Schneider from, from here. And then those are the other concepts, the ExoC, uh, the ExoS, the AFTA, which gets a lot of press right now. I don't know if you heard about them, but it's their pretty much Hubble telescope that got given to to NASA, and now we're trying to put a chronograph on it. And then what they call the new world uh, systems. It's that's interesting like, that the chronograph people brought the W. <laughs> the what, sorry? The, the cosmologists call it W first after. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's W first, it's after. It goes back and forth. But yes, so we're trying to actually impact on the cosmologist. Yeah. And just, um, so this was just the Alpha Centauri. And then, that's also to show one application of the super Nyquist method is to do bigger field of view imaging, where you could pretty much move your correctable region to different places on the sky. That would be one piece, and then you just like, move, and then you can reconstruct you know, a bigger you know, field of view. I'm not talking about 3.5 degrees, but at least in, you know, more than, than Um So, so far, Yes, the, the next step is to actually, since we proved the concept, is to go to the laboratory and then test that in the lab. So there's a couple of students that are available to do so. And uh, do like the normal optical design and purchase of the components and all that. And that's pretty much it, unless you have questions. Uh, so I guess the what I wanted to show you in this talk is how uh, complicated like chronographic can be and how precise in terms of weapon control and sensing it had to be. And that's kind of what I wanted you to come home with. And, and also the other message is that we actually now have capabilities to look at Jupiter-like planets, like real. The Earth-like planets, we still have to wait like 2020 or something like that to, uh, to have them on uh, online, but we can detect Jupiter-like planets and start to understand planets a little bit better. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, we have some few moments for questions.
questions, if there are other questions. Um, Ian, who, who do we have online right now? Uh, I think this is two viewers. I don't know the system well enough to say how long it took them up. So this multi-star extreme AO, that's the first time anybody's done this, yeah. or are there competing ideas? No, this is the first. As, as far as we know, we haven't found anything in the literature that we know that. I think people are really busy doing everything. In the so, and so far it's all in simulation, and how yes. long will it be until you can make a system? We have to uh, apply for proposals, so before the end of the year, it's from yeah. It's, it's, it should be a simple, I'm going to stop saying simple, but it should be straightforward. <laughs> Uh, because you, we have the, as I showed before, we have the actual um, laboratory design uh, test bed, and so we just had to. It's not it. a big modification. It's not a big modification. Um, so we can use that and then use it to do the software. And we keep the same appetizing mirrors? Yes. Yeah. So the, maybe the one issue would be uh, what to integrate real life problems like vibration. The noise, the down noise that we, I don't actually. Picture noise, photon uh, noise, we will have vibration, the frequency of the vibration, because those is, this is something that a, a colleague of mine is looking at. I'm oh, sorry. I'm I left, I stopped it. Stop. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, go back into presentation mode. Anyway, uh, yeah, my brain goes through all that. The, um, all those satellites, they do have a certain amount of vibration. And I don't have in my head kind of the, the frequency and of, of, of those vibrations, but this is going to introduce like jitter, which is why you have a lower the wave and sensor, but you're still going to have a residual that you will need to take into account. And what about the attitude control on the spacecraft? Is that stacked um, much higher than normally? I wouldn't assume so, but I haven't really looked at it. This is kind of on the beginning of, we have many to, to figure out those kind of. We haven't done the end-to-end -end simulation yet. So taking into account all that, like the noise, those latitude. Um, because yes, we have uh, reaction waves, and so you have to make sure that this is really well precise. But we're digging out in the literature to see what the constraints on those are. All right, so I think uh, next on our agenda is lunch. So, Bill, did you set something up for lunch?